This is going to be a study on the subject of I don't want to be a Pharisee. And we're going to look at Matthew chapter 23. Starting in verse 1, it says, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So, the, one of the first things about a Pharisee is they abuse authority. So someone like a supervisor or a policeman or principal or anyone else with any kind of authority can be real jerks if they abuse the authority that they have, that God's given to them. Verse 3, And therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not after, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. So what's something else about a Pharisee? They're hypocrites. In verse 3, the Lord doesn't tell us not to do what they say. He says don't do as they do. They say one thing and do another. There's been times in the past where someone at work was quick to judge how I worked, yet they do a lot worse than me. In this situation, most times the peop what the people are telling you to do, even though they're hypocrites, what they're telling you to do is the right thing. And would make you better. So the thing to do is take their advice, do what they say, but don't do as they do. They're a Pharisee. They want to walk around and look at you and see how you work and tell you how to do things. But they don't want to do the same things themselves. So the best thing you can do is, if it's the right thing, do what they're saying. Just don't do as they do because they're not going to do it. They're a Pharisee. All right, verse 4, For they bind heavy burdens, and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. So look at that. They bind heavy burdens which are hard to be borne, which means hard to carry. They're putting stuff on you that's hard for you to carry around. For example, some preachers teach a man can't remarry after a divorce unless his former wife dies. So they will have the man would have to live the rest of his life burning in his lust. So it's things like that. They bind heavy burdens. Things like being a celibate the rest of your life. If you've been divorced or something. Even though Paul said it's better to marry than to burn. Even though Paul uh, says over and over things that show that a, a person is allowed to remarry if you know their spouse dies or uh, stepped out on them or deserted them okay let's look at verse 5 but all their works they do to be seen of men they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the border, borders of their garments so their works aren't for God, they're to be seen of men. It's all for them, it's all for show. And we know the Lord looks on the heart and sees their hearts wicked. As it says in 1 Samuel sixteen seven, For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. The Pharisees, they're doing it all for show. They're doing it all for themselves. And the Bible says in Matthew 6, 5 through 7, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. There's your Pharisee. For they love to pray standing in, their, in the synagogue and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. You got to watch out for these people that just love praying in the public because it makes them look good. It says, Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Their reward is getting honor from men. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetition, things like Hail Marys, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. So the greatest praying and worship is done in private where nobody can see you, where nobody's going to think, oh, how spiritual you are. It's just you and God. But the Pharisees do things for show. Do you find that in your life you're doing things for show? 
It says there in Matthew 23 and verse 5, But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. So what's the phylacteries? That's these little leather boxes with scriptures enclosed inside. And they would wear them just for the purpose of looking spiritual. Um, they'd put them around their forehead and look ultra spiritual with the scriptures inside. And many people do this today. Many people take a Bible to church because, you know, they just want to look super spiritual, even though they never read it. They never read their Bible. The only time they read their Bible is when the preacher says, open to Matthew 23. And that's the only time they read it. Uh, they're not reading it. They just want to look spiritual. Uh, they enlarge the borders of their garments. You see that there in verse 5? They enlarge the borders of their garments. The Old Testament talks about how the, fr uh, the fringes are supposed to be on the robes and things like that. So the Pharisees thought they were holy because of their clothes. Many people are like that. They think, I got a, on a suit and tie. I got a little hanky in a pocket. So I'm super spiritual. This doesn't make you spiritual. If that makes you spiritual and, and just right with God, look at Benny Hinn. He's got more expensive suits than every man in the church put together. James 2, 3 says... And if you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit under my footstool. So here James is talking about some people are nice to a person because of what they got on. But you should be nice to the person with a t-shirt, jeans, and tattoos. You should be as nice to them as you are the person with a suit and a tie on. And I mean, there's all kinds of churches that just really put something on to try to look spiritual. Like one time I was driving past this Episcopal church and it was dark outside and I seen a, a guy in a white robe walking across the street. It was almost creepy being that dark and seeing, seeing him like that. But he's trying to do that to look super spiritual like a Pharisee. Uh, you can't see our righteousness through our clothes until we get our right, white robes in heaven. Uh, the Bible says, fine linen is the righteousness of saints. You're not going to see my righteousness through my clothes until I get a glorified body. But these people, for they bind heavy burdens, grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to, for to be seen of men, they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. So if you, if you make the outward appearance to be the best evidence of righteousness, then it can be counterfeited. You also don't have to worry about the inside as much if you do that. I heard a preacher say he thought another preacher compromised because he didn't have a tie on. I mean, come on, really? I know some great... Past, you probably don't know them, but I know some great pastors and Bible-believing teachers who don't even wear a suit and tie. I know that you probably don't know who I'm talking about, but I mean, they don't, I've never seen them wear one. And they're much more of a Bible believer than your average pastor. They're much more of a uh, just an all-around Bible student. But uh, people put a lot of a lot of thought on clothes, and just you know, just wear something that's modest. It doesn't. Who who's to say that all this the suit and tie stuff that you have to wear that to be right with God? Now the next thing they love the uppermost rooms. Okay, there in Matthew twenty three. They love the uppermost rooms. They want to sit in the VIP section. They want to sit at the cool kids' table. They want to be the men standing behind the big shot preacher who's placed himself above the people. Have you ever 
watch just some of this these sermons on YouTube. I'm a big watcher of preaching, but some of the sermons on YouTube are hard to watch, so you just got to listen to them because you've got the there's a big shot preacher up there, and then he's got all these little minions sitting behind him, looking at him like they're worshiping him or something. I'm thinking, why are they all sitting behind him? Why don't they just sit down in the in the congregation there? I mean, not every time, but a lot of times it looks like they're trying to look super spiritual up there sitting behind the preacher, just acting like they're just completely devoted to everything that he's saying. And I've even seen some like, the pastor say some extremely stupid and inappropriate things, and they're just in complete agreement with him, saying amen and all this stuff. They're just, they're trying to look super spiritual with their clothes, where they're sitting, agreeing with everything the big shot Pharisee pastor or evangelist says. But it's just a bunch of Pharisees is all it is. They love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. Now, verse 8. It says, or in verse 7. And greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. So they wanted to make themselves a name. They like these big shot names. They uh, like the people at the Tower of Babel. They want to make themselves a name. They want the preeminence like Diotrephes that John warns us about. So they place their name above the name Jesus Christ. They place their name above the name of every name. The Bible says that in all things he might have the preeminence, not you. You know, calling a Catholic priest father is unbiblical. Unbiblical. Jesus said, call no man on earth your father, in the spiritual sense. Uh, Pharisees think they are something when they are actually nothing. So they deceive themselves. Satan himself wanted to be the most high. And if you're wanting to be the most high, if you're wanting to be the greatest, if that is your greatest goal, then you're being like the devil. To go up, you have to come down. You get down and pray, sit down and read, then God's going to exalt you. Let's look at Luke 18, 10 through 14. It says, Two men went up in, into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess, and the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house, justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So the Pharisee, he didn't tell God, thank you for being merciful because I'm a dirty, rotten dog. He was telling God, thank you, God, that I'm not like all these other men. Thank you that I fast twice in the week and I do all these other things. And I have heard like a preacher or something get up after the sermon and say, God, we thank you that we're not like these people that believe this and this and this. And I mean, just brag the entire time. The entire time he was praying, he was bragging on himself, being very self-righteous. That is a mark of a Pharisee. If when you get down to pray, I mean, I can understand if, you know, you're saying, thank you, God, because I'm not a drug addict anymore, or something like that. Or thank you, God, that I'm not in their situation. But when all that you're doing when you pray is you're never saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner, then you're being like a Pharisee. Because every time that I go to pray, I feel like I can't even get get a prayer answered if I don't say, God, forgive me for such and such or forgive me for something that I don't even know that I did. Because I feel very unworthy and very just 
guilty to it, but when I approach God. So you need to, to, to be sure that you know that you ain't worth shooting because, you know, God doesn't like this superior attitude like you're better than everybody else and that you haven't done nothing wrong since the last time you talked to him because most likely you have. Even if it was just a bad thought that you had, you've done something wrong since the last time that you talked to God. But they love these greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But in Matthew 23, 8, Jesus says, But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And then he says, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. So it's unbiblical to call the Catholic priest's father. He says, Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. You see, if you want to go up, you come down. You get down on your knees and pray. You sit down and read the Bible, and God will exalt you. But he says, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. So you see that? They're Satan's helpers. They are stumbling blocks to people. And in our modern day sense, they, uh, they try, it's like they're trying to shut up the kingdom of God. Like these Pharisees here were shutting up the kingdom of heaven. Today, there's Pharisees that are trying their best to put a stumbling block in front of the kingdom of God. They lead, them, they lead people to religion and not to Jesus Christ, by their tradition. You see there, it says, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you set up, shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. And they turn people, they turn people off of Jesus Christ with their stupid tradition. And, you know, they're going to be held accountable for this. The Bible says in Romans 14, 7, No man liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. So be careful of teaching your own preference and convictions like the Pharisees do. And it says in verse 14, For pretense make long prayer. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses. And for a pretense make long prayer, Therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. They are pretenders. Pretense. They're pretenders. It goes back to them being in it for show. They're in it for show. Verse 14 also talks about a greater damnation. This shows there's different levels to the eternal damnation. Everlasting fire. Religious people get greater damnation because they're leading more people to hell. The Bible talks about the lowest hell. And, you know, the, these religious people, they look good outwardly, but they're worse than drunks and dopers and all the people that you see as wicked. Verse 15, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you can pass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. They're going out and, and teaching people to be like they are, getting proselytes, proselyting people. This is someone you get converted over to your belief system, is what a proselyte is. A person hardened by religion is the hardest person to win to Christ. There's a bunch of Pharisees out there that are getting a hold of people and proselyting them and making them twofold more the child of hell than themselves. And makes these people harder to win to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the next thing in verse 14, it says they devour widows' houses. They're covetous. That's another thing about a Pharisee. A Pharisee's covetous. Then in verse 15, it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you can pass, see, and land to make one 
proselyte. And when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Woe unto you, blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing, but whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gold, or the temple that sanctifieth the gold. And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing, but whoso sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gift, or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it, and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God, and by him that sitteth thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment and mercy and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind gods, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. One to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. You see verses 15 through 25, you see they care more about gifts and gold than they do the things of more importance because they can buy things with gold and they can eat the gifts that are put on the altar. But they're forgetting the important things. Aren't these little temporal things? The important things is God, heaven, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Set up for yourself treasures in heaven, not on the earth. The importance is the spiritual things, not these temporal things. As Paul says, for we look not on the things which are temporal. We want to look at the things which are eternal. We want to look at the things which are not seen, not the things which are seen. But next, in verse 23 and 24, you see that the Pharisees are gnat strainers. Do you know what a gnat strainer is? A gnat strainer is someone that will jump on your case about something little that you did, and then they'll swallow something huge. They will place much significance on little things and then not worry about the big things. For example, when I, wor I worked at this one place and I would get black all over my hands when I worked and then I'd go eat a sandwich while I had the black on my hands. I probably shouldn't have done that, but that's just what I did. And, you know, all these men would come in, they'd be cussing, saying profanity, dirty jokes, and they would literally, I never said anything about their dirty jokes. I don't feel like it's my place to tell people what to, what and what not to say because, you know, they got freedom of speech. You know, I don't like dirty jokes and I don't cuss. I don't laugh at what they're saying. But it's not my place to tell them how to talk in the workplace. So, but they they got the nerve to tell me that I should be washing my hands before I eat, which I should. I, I should wash my hands. That's good advice. But they have no right to tell me that because they need their mouth washed out. But that's a Pharisee. And they, they're they sitting there telling you what to live and how to do when they have no idea how to live. It says in Matthew twenty three twenty four, You blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. So it says, you blind guys would strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. They're, they're disgusted by me touching bread. I don't even think I was touching the bread. I had a little plastic baggie around it as I was eating it. But they're not disgusted by their filthy, rotten mouth. Their mouth is, is what's nasty. And, uh, for example, I know this older woman who would get onto me for washing my hands. Yes, she screams at her husband. I've had that happen. I've had someone, you know, this, this woman, she would say something about me not washing my hands before I ate. And yet, yet she screams at her husband like a dog, like he's a, a no good dog. Or, uh, someone will gossip about somebody missing church. Yet all they do when they're at church is gossip about everyone that missed church. 
You know, things like this. They strain at a gnat, they swallow a camel. And next, in verse 25 and 26, one of you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. So they're, they're clean on the outside, but on the inside they're filthy. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. So they're evil inwardly. They're full of extortion. Extortion is taking money by force. They're covetous. Their God is their belly. Full of extortion and excess. Excess is Im immoderation. And uh, they got onto Jesus for not washing his hands, but they needed to wash their heart. Luke eleven thirty seven through 39. And as he spake, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with him, and he went in and sat down to meet. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. And the Lord said unto him, Now do you Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. So they're judging them for not washing their hands, yet they need a, a body wash for the inside because it's filthy in there. So they're evil inside, but look good on the outside. Matthew 27 and 28. Well, new scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but within they're full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also appear outward, appear, also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. You see that there? They're like unto whited sepulchres. We may get beautiful caskets, but all that is in the casket is a dead body. The Pharisees may look good on the outside, but on the inside they're just full of dead men's bones. What an illustration by the Lord Jesus Christ there. In verse 18 it talks about appearing righteous. And tradition and relig religion helps you appear righteous. A, a man with jeans and a tattoo can be just as right as someone without those things. Now, I'm not um, suggesting you go, you go get a tattoo and just dress like some type of a thug or something. But there are people who, you know, when they go to church, they just wear button-up shirt and jeans. Maybe they've got tattoos from when they were living wild before salvation and things like that. And these people can be just as righteous as the person that comes in with a suit and tie on. It's like so much emphasis on the suit and tie when you listen to a lot of preachers. I mean, they're, they're really, you know, like this one preacher I heard, he said, uh, talked about a, a, a good man that he knew of that came in the church and he was really into the Bible, he said, but he didn't wear a tie. So he looked down on him for that, I'm thinking... You know, maybe he didn't have the money to buy a tie. And maybe he just didn't like wearing a tie. Who's to say that you got to do all these certain things, these little traditional things? Maybe it's not in someone's personality or character to wear those types of clothes. Who's to say we all got to wear the same types of clothes? As long as it's modest, as long as it's not showing your body off and got dirty things written on them, wear what you want to wear. It's silly for us all to have to look just alike, speak just alike. I mean, we all want to be, be in one accord, believe in the same things. But I believe God makes individuals, we're not all just alike. And I mean, you, somebody might say, well, they're being worldly by coming in with a t-shirt or jeans on. Okay, how is that being worldly? You're just wearing the clothes that you got to buy at the store. And I mean, how is it? If, if that's worldly, then how is not a shirt and tie, uh, uh, suit and tie not worldly? Think about it. I mean, Joe Biden wears a shirt and t suit and tie. Um, you know, uh, the, who, who do you think the sex traffickers are? It's rich businessmen that wear a suit and tie. Now, I'm not saying I'm against a suit and tie, somebody wearing that. 
I mean, I think it looks good and all that. But, I mean, there's way too much emphasis placed on that and not enough emphasis placed on teaching people they need to be a Bible student, read the Bible, study the Bible, memorize the Bible, and all these other things that really matter. All the emphasis is being placed on these outward tradition. And that's the mark of a Pharisee. Another thing is the Pharisees have a heart of hate and murder. Look at verse 25. It says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we should not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, you be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous bloodshed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel and to the blood of Zacharias, son of Berechias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. So you see, they have a heart of hate and murder. They killed the prophets. They killed the righteous. They crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. They stoned Stephen. They killed James with the sword. They scourged Paul. And Jesus says they are guilty of all the blood of the Old Testament prophets from Abel to Zacharias. You know, these people have hate and murder in their heart. They're jealous of you many times because they see you doing what you're supposed to do. And they're not doing what they're supposed to do. So it puts them under a little bit of conviction, makes them feel like, well, he's doing better than me. So I've got to find fault with him and point out faults about him and dig, dig up dirt about him and expose him to everybody because he showed me out in some way. Another thing is they are willful rejectors. God sent preachers to them. He came to them himself. And so he said he would have gathered them as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, but they wouldn't accept him. He is a whosoever will God, but they're on, they only care about themselves. In verse 38, we see that he is departing from the house. In verse 38, it says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. It's no longer the house of God. Just like the lost man's body is not the temple of the Holy Ghost because he rejects the Savior. They re these uh, Pharisees reject Jesus Christ. And he says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. In verse 39, he's saying they won't see him again until the second coming. It says in verse 39, For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And at this time all Israel shall be saved. But there's a lot of, uh, of people that are going to reject him. And they're going to be they, they're gonna wish, be wishing they were on the winning side in that war. And not on the losing side because the blood's going to be up to the horse's bridles. But this has been Matthew chapter 23. And we've looked at Pharisees and why I don't want to be a Pharisee.